Hi, I'm Mr. O'Rourke, and I'm going to be talking about the structure of the Earth today. There are two ways to look at the structure of the Earth. We can look at it from a compositional way, what's the chemistry or what type of atoms and compounds make up the different layers of it, or we can think of it from a physical aspect. What, is it a liquid? Is it a solid? Those types of things. So we're going to look at it in both those ways and kind of try to combine them a little bit in the end. We also need to consider density through this whole lesson and through most things that we talk about in Earth and Space Science. Density is hugely important. So when we talk about density, the more dense something is, the more it tends to sink or float to the center of the sphere or the Earth. The less dense type of things tend to float and become the crust in the outer part of the Earth. So, looking at the three compositional layers, we have the crust, the mantle, and the core. Crust is extremely thin compared to the mantle and the core, makes up a very small percentage of the overall Earth. The mantle makes about two-thirds of the Earth, and the core makes up about a third of the Earth. Okay, now the composition of the rocks within the crust are high in silicon and oxygen. Those rocks are not as dense as ones that are higher, low contents of silicon and oxygen and higher contents of like iron and magnesium and things like that. So the crustal rocks have higher silicon and oxygen. The oceanic crust, being a lower laying crust, is higher in iron and magnesium. It has a lot more than the continental crust, which is the least dense of all, sits the highest. More dense crust is the iron and magnesium rich basalt of the oceanic crust. The granite within the continental crust, not so much. Very high silica, very high oxygen, not much iron and magnesium in that. As we go down deeper into the earth, the mantle, you still have silicate rocks there, but the concentrations of iron and magnesium, nickel and things like that become much, much greater. Okay, this is much more dense rock than the crustal rocks, okay? And it is the thickest layer. We get to the core, down there there's almost no oxygen or silicon down there. It's all metal, okay? It's mostly iron and nickel and other types of, of heavier elements, radioactive elements, which gives the core some of its heat, why it's so hot down there. Um, now that we've done the three compositional layers, kind of like what components make them up. We want to talk about, or I want to talk about, how do we know what we know? What, how do we know what's down there? We've never been through the crust. We've never gotten down there and, and stuck a thermometer down there or tested what was down there. How do we know what we know? To do that, we have to talk about the structure of the earth. How do we know about the crust, mantle, and core? What, what gives us these clues? Earthquakes or would give us those clues. When an earthquake happens, the stronger the earthquake, the stronger the waves, the, the more violent the waves travel through the earth. They just don't travel along the surface, they travel through the interior of the earth as well. Now, earthquake recording stations all over the world record these things. Well, at some point, we noticed that there was something missing. There was two main types of earthquake waves. P waves, primary waves, are so the first waves to get there, and then there's secondary waves, a little bit slower, um, have a different type of motion. Well, from here, around here, this part of the world wasn't getting any S waves at all, okay? But everywhere else was. Scientists inferred that they were hitting a liquid barrier. P waves can move through it. They've done it in the lab. They do it in the lab all the time but S waves cannot move through a liquid. So they inferred through all this earthquake data that the core was liquid, that there was a liquid core there that it was hitting and it wasn't transmitting them through. Okay, and that, that worked for a while, but when they kept pouring over them, they weren't being deflected the way that they thought they should be if it was an all liquid core by looking at how they that the P waves were being redeflected as they moved through, the innermost part of this, this liquid core had to be solid, okay? So by seeing how these earthquake waves happen, we were able to get a picture of the inside of the Earth, much the same way that, uh, that a baby can be seen through a sonogram, okay, an ultrasound. You can see the baby through there bouncing sound waves off it, 
Earthquake waves are very similar. So we use the earthquakes to get a picture of the Earth. Okay? Um, one of the other questions is, well, how do we know that it gets hotter as we go down and, and, and all that stuff? That's another thing that, that, that we would like to explain. Now, temperature increases with depth. Now, logically, you can think that, that when the Earth cracks open and there's a vol volcano, hot stuff comes out of that. Okay? You can kind of infer that, yeah, the deeper you go down, it's going to get hotter. Um, deep mines, the deepest mines we have, as the deeper you go, the hotter it gets. Okay? So it's obvious that temperature increases as we go, as we go deeper. How much? Okay, we have a pretty good idea, but unless we actually go down there, we can't actually confirm it. So this is our best estimate. It was 5,000 degrees was the hottest, was the core, was what they thought. But now, recent uh, studies have shown that the core is actually probably a little hotter than we thought it was. Now, where did that heat come from? Um, when the Earth formed, okay, when the solar system formed, through collisions and everything, enormous amounts of heat, okay, happen when they form. It's not like two rocks clacking together and then breaking apart. Smaller ones would, but once you get to grow large enough, you have these large bodies. When they hit, they don't slam like, like you think. They kind of grind together and kind of come one in the gravity. They, they leave and they come back and they keep hitting each other and slamming into each other until finally they, they're just a big molten blob. Okay, now this molten blob, the more dense materials are going to sink to the, to the center and the least dense materials are going to move out to the, migrate out to the edge. Okay, so when the earth formed. Once that, once it, the impact slowed down and there wasn't as many, it was able to cool enough that you get a crust. That crust acts like a blanket and holds the heat into the earth. Now sometimes that heat builds up in there, and needs to be released. It's released in volcanoes. It's one of the ways that the Earth uh, gives off some heat. Other things that make the interior hot is that gravitational potential energy of heavier materials moving towards the core is or releasing energy as it goes down. Another last thing is that radioactive materials in the core, the most dense things that are like uranium and things like that, give off radiation and that adds heat to the core and that heat needs to get get out somehow. Okay, so it's trying to radiate the heat out. The crust acts like a blanket and keeps the heat down there. Hopefully, you know, that kind of gives us a, a, a good base basis to jump off on to start the physical layers. Okay, so now, one other thing that happens when we talk about um, going down, what's in the interior of the earth, how do we know it's hot, we can also infer that pressure builds as you go down. If you were laying somewhere and you had a couple feet of dirt or rock on top of you, that would be really heavy. Well now think if you had a mile of rock on top of you, how heavy would that be? Well now a hundred miles, a thousand miles of rock on top of you pressing down, that the pressure would be enormous. Okay? So now we have the competition of two things happening. Increasing heat as you go deeper into the earth, and also increasing pressure. As you increase the heat, the rock tends to want to melt. Okay? If you get it hot enough, a rock will start to melt. And the temperatures that are found in the mantle and the core should be hot enough to melt rock at the surface of the earth. But because there's pressure pushing down, the rock pushing down, it's not letting the rock melt. Okay? Just like I did a demonstration earlier in the year, where I heated some water up. It wasn't boiling, I put it in a bell jar, and I started vacuuming the air out of the bell jar. Well, the air pressure is putting, pushing down on the top of the water. It's not letting anything happen to the water. Well, once I started vacuuming the air out, those molecules of water had enough energy to escape to the gas state. It started boiling without adding any energy to it. Without that blanket of air pushing down, at 15 pounds per square inch, it was able to break loose and to boil at a cooler temperature than normal. Well, the same thing happens with rock. As the rock goes down, it gets hotter, it wants to melt,
but the pressure is trying to keep it a solid. So there's a battle going on in the physical layers. And this battle kind of shakes out to our physical layers. Is it solid or liquid as we go, go down through it? So let's take a look. The lithosphere, at the temperature and pressure of the lithosphere, which is, includes the crust and the very upper part of the mantle, at that temperature and pressure, it's solid. Okay, the rocks are solid. Okay, they're not liquid at all. Now this lithosphere is broken into pieces, plates, and that's floating on the next layer, the asthenosphere. Okay, the rocks up here have the highest concentration of silicon and oxygen and aluminum. These type of things are lighter. Once we get down to the asthenosphere, okay, at that temperature and pressure, we have the rocks are a little more dense, okay, a little more iron and magnesium, a little less silicon and oxygen, a little more dense. At that temperature and pressure, they get soft, soft enough that they can flow. They're kind of like silly putty, like a plastic kind of thing. It's kind of like it's happy, okay, it, it can flow, it can move. Not like a solid rock has a very hard time moving with temperature. But now the heat from the core coming up heats the bottom of this. Okay, Some places in the core are hotter than others that are, have bigger um, deposits of uranium and things like that. That causes the heat to come up and heats up parts of this asthenosphere. Those hotter spots that are there, as it's heated, will start to rise. Okay, As it's heated, the particles vibrate faster, move out, decreasing the density. Decreased density, it will start to rise. More dense, cooler material starts to fill in down the bottom. So you get these convection currents happening in, in, your, in the asthenosphere. These convection currents are extremely important because these convection currents are responsible for pulling plates apart, pushing them together, or sliding them side by side, causing volcanoes, earthquakes on, on the surface of the earth. This is really where we get down to what are the mechanics, what physically is going on here. So the asthenosphere is an extremely important uh, part of the earth and understanding that helps us understand what's going on with earthquakes, volcano, and plate tectonics. So this plastic area is very important, comes through and it moves. It moves the plates around. Now, the next part is the mesosphere, okay? We can see that the mantle incorporates some uh, of it incorporates the some of the lithosphere, okay, the asthenosphere and the mesosphere. This is the mantle. The lithosphere here has the crust and the lithosphere. Whereas we look here on well, the compositional layers, you have the crust, mantle, and core. Crust is this little layer on top. The mantle incorporates the lithosphere, okay, the, the bottom part of the lithosphere, but the lithosphere also includes the crust with it. When we're talking about it, this is the solid layer. The plastic layer is the asthenosphere, okay? Lithosphere is solid, plastic layer is the asthenosphere, the one that flows. The next one, the mesosphere, is basically the boring layer. It's solid rock. It does flow, but because it's solid, it flows extremely slowly. It's kind of like the boring layer. Um, heat's gone through there, but at this temperature and pressure, the pressures are enough that it keeps it solid rock. It's hard. It's a solid rock all the way through. The earthquake data kind of shows how the earthquake waves move through this type of material. When we get down to here, we get down to the core, we get down to the next layer is the outer core. Now the outer core is a liquid that is extremely important to what's going on. The earthquake waves couldn't pass through a liquid, fine. We have our liquid outer core. At this temperature and pressure, models and experiments in the lab show that iron is a liquid at that temperature and pressure. Okay. As we go down, even further, pressure wins out again and at the center, squeezes it into a tight iron ball at the center of the planet. Now, very important because as the Earth rotates, these, the liquid outer core and the solid inner core spin at different rates. This creates a dynamo within the Earth and creates the Earth's magnetic field. 
This magnetic field is extremely important to life on Earth. Okay, it protects us from the sun's solar wind. Mars being a much smaller planet, its core had cooled. Okay, there's evidence from uh, the space vehicles and the landforms there that there was once a lot of water on Mars and probably had a thick atmosphere. Now it doesn't. What is thought to happen is, because it's half the size of the Earth, it cooled quickly. Okay, the interior, the inner core cooled, the whole core cooled, and it's solid, no more magnetic field, and the solar wind bled away the atmosphere. All the oxygen and nit nitrogen that was in that atmosphere is gone. It was blown away in the solar wind without a magnetic shield to protect the Earth. As a solar wind approaches the Earth, it hits this magnetic field and flows around the Earth. Some of it gets sucked in at the poles that cause the northern lights, but most of it gets shunted around the Earth and protects our atmosphere from it. So this is extremely important to what's going on and life on Earth, this solid inner core, liquid outer core. So hopefully you enjoyed this demonstration on the structure of the Earth. And uh, I'll be seeing you in class.